Though motives are usually different from their male counterparts, women serial killers leave just as much mayhem and destruction. Dorothea Puente would kill her tenants and cash their checks to have nice things such as clothes and designer perfumes. Then on a different spectrum, you had someone like Kristen Gilbert, who was a nurse. She would cause cardiac arrest in her patients to try and revive them. Ultimately, with the power of her job as a nurse, in a way it gave her the same power of God. But what if you were to combine these traits to manufacture a money-hungry nurse who had no problem destroying lives to get the things she envied? Well, then you would have Dana Sue Gray. Hello and welcome to this episode of California True Crime. I'm Sean and I will be leading this episode today. With me, like last time, are Jessica and Charles. How are you guys? I'm good. Yeah, doing great. Thanks for asking. So for this episode, I'm covering something that has been covered quite a bit, like on other podcasts or stuff like that. But like usual, I somehow have never heard of this case. Have you guys before? No, I actually hadn't. I think we always kind of laugh about that when we're looking at these but uh this is another example of a of a case here in california i had no no connection with and hadn't heard i've seen a few things about it and i think i've seen some podcasts we follow um share some stuff about it but i don't know too much about the actual case itself so a lot of this information i found for this case comes from the californian out of temecula and the times advocate in escondido i also watched the episode covered by Diabolical Women about her, and which I will admit wasn't as bad as a lot of those shows that I've watched before. In advance, I'd like to say it was kind of hard to find info about this case. I mean, I think what we're covering is pretty much what everyone else covered, because there wasn't just, a, it was pretty straightforward in what I could find. Another thing, I didn't find a lot on the victims, which always bothers me because. We should at least acknowledge and know about the victims, but it was hard to find that information too. So uh, I'll give you as much as I did find. A tiny background before we get into it is that we will be in Southern California in Riverside County in 1994. We'll get a little more into that in a bit, but I think we should start by introducing some of the background on the murderer of Dana Sue Gray. I found a thesis from someone who studied women serial killers, and I was able to get a little background on Dana. Uh, She was born in 1957, and it talks about how she had a rough childhood where she would act out trying to get attention. Her parents split when she was two, and she went with her mother. Um, Her mother ended up dying when Dana was 14 of cancer. Other things that I found, she, she did like the kind of serial killer thing that they, the, she would do animal torture. The situation that it was in, it was in a group setting. So I can't fully, I don't fully want to say that she tortured animals. It seemed like she did, but it could have been peer pressure or anything. It was when she was a teenager. So when you say group setting, do you mean like a group home or? No, I meant like it wasn't like her alone torturing animals. Supposedly it was her and a bunch of kids and they would like throw cats off of a roof and stuff like that. So it wasn't just the story that I read. It wasn't just her by herself torturing animals. Doesn't mean that she didn't do it on her own. This was just what I saw. As she got older, she chose a career to be a nurse, and it was a labor and delivery nurse at Inland Valley Regional Medical Center. She got married around the end of 1987 to a man from Temecula. At some point, her husband lost his job, and she had to pick up more work. Everything kind of seemed to go down a downward spiral from this point. They got in bad debt. The house was foreclosed on. With her job at the medical center, she was there from August 1990, but lost it in November of 1993. A little bit before she lost her job, she had a miscarriage and started taking uh, prescription drugs for herself from like the trauma. 
she lost her job because she was caught stealing drugs from the ER. When she loses her job because she was caught stealing drugs from the medical center, does she go to jail or anything like that? Or Not that I know of. That was 1993, and this all happened in 94, so I don't know if there was any pending charges, but she didn't go to jail or anything that I know of. So, so more of like she got caught by her employer and then was summarily uh, excused from employment or, or terminated. That's what it seems to be. Without calling police. Were they for her own use? That's what it, yeah, I gather. Not okay. to sell, to she make money like, or okay. anything like that. So because of all this, she, uh, they, her and her husband ended up filing for divorce, but sometimes, sometime in between separation and the actual divorce, she moved in with another man who had a roughly four to five year old son. And I say all this not to say I feel sorry for her, but this is just the background of what's going on building up to what happens. On February 16th, 86-year-old Norma Davis was found murdered in her home on Continental Drive, which is part of the Canyon Lake Estates. Norma Davis's friend Alice had gone over to pick her up. Her and Alice were part of a weekly bridge group. Norma had been stabbed 11 times. She had a very deep neck wound, and two knives were left in her body. One of the knives was in her chest. The other was in her neck. There wasn't much evidence at all around, but they did find a small size running shoe, size six footprint uh, found at the scene close to the front of the door. It was like in dust. From information from the detective that was assigned to the case from the Paris Police Department, which was a close by police department, uh, his name was Joseph Greco. He said that Norma was sitting in a recliner. The TV was still on and it almost just looked like she was sleeping. And there was no real witnesses. There was also not much detail how this murder took place. It didn't say too much of how Dana pulled this off. At first, Jerry Armbrist, who was Norma Davis's daughter-in-law from a previous marriage, she became a suspect because she had access to the house. She had the same shoe type as the imprint. So this might be hard to follow, but let me, let me try. Jerry was married to a man named Bill Davis. And Bill Davis's mom was the victim, Norma Davis. After Bill died, Jerry still took care of her mother-in-law, even though Bill had died. Jerry then goes on to meet a man named Bruce Armbrist, which she will marry. Bruce is Dana Gray's father from a previous marriage. So Jerry is Dana's stepmom. So Dana has no relation, no blood relation to Norma, but technically is somewhat part of the family. So... Uh, Were they close, or was it a a congenial family relationship? They knew each other. I guess, uh, supposedly, uh, Norma was in a car accident, like, a previous year before this, and Dana actually took care of her because, you know, she was a nurse. Right. Was uh, Jerry cleared soon after? I mean, you said she was a suspect uh, because she had access in similar shoes. Was she eventually, like, cleared quickly, or... Was that a longer investigation that Jerry was continually in the eyes of the police? It seemed like they looked at her because of convenience, mm-hmm. but as they kept talking to her and her hoping to help and everything like that, it seemed like she did. She just became less of a suspect, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it kind of was the only suspect at the time. So I don't know if she was like fully cleared right away, but at the same time, she was helping. So with this one, with Jerry just as the suspect, but they're not sure, and there wasn't much else to go on. But only a couple weeks later, on February 28th, June Elizabeth Roberts, who was 66 years old, was found murdered just south of Norma's house, still in, in Canyon Lake area, but this time in a mobile home park. It wasn't just south, but it was south of it in the same area. This mobile home park was also a gated community. Two neighbors found her when they had gone over there because they were all supposed to go out to dinner. Unlike the previous murder, June was strangled and bludgeoned to death with a wine decanter. The story goes that Gray went into Robert's home while her boyfriend's son just stayed in the car. So she pulls up to the house, says, I'll be back or something like that to the kid who's almost five, and he just stays in the car. When she went up to June's house, she asked her for a book about how to help her with her drinking problem. Uh, When she was let into the house, Gray then unplugged the phone cord, which she strangled her with. 
Gray ended up stealing two of her June's credit cards. Uh, when the body was found, the phone cord was still around her neck and it was tied to a chair. The one thing is, like what you were talking about, though, Jerry was also friends with June Roberts. So it's almost two weeks goes by. They might have been suspecting her. Maybe it came back up that she's a suspect because she knows right. this person, too. Right. But she was still trying to help and everything. So they, they, they didn't have much to go on. They did say that two credit cards were stolen at the time. And before we go any further, since we have Canyon Lake going on, Charles, I think you have some uh, information about Canyon Lake and the layout of it. Yeah, I, this was kind of interesting because I know when, when you were doing this, initially putting this case together and we started talking about it and you mentioned in Canyon Lake and it, it, Southern California, when we looked it up, it's kind of an interesting spot. Its history goes all the way back to 1882. Um, it, like a lot of places in Southern California, was created when rail lines, uh, first the California Southern Rail Ro- Railroad, and eventually Southern or Santa Fe Rail Line comes in. And in order to make way stations for rail lines, uh, they would buy up a lot of land, build a station, and then a community would kind of pop up along that. Eventually, what happens is that the area gets bought by the uh, Temescal Water Company. Uh, and then they lease the property. Well, they dam up a river, create a reservoir, and buy up all their surrounding areas and lease it out as a recreational area. And so Canyon Lake then sprouts out of this recreational area slash uh, man-made reservoir lake. Eventually, uh, it really gets its start as kind of a residence for people right around uh, late 60s, early 70s. And what happens is as it progresses, it really turns into kind of a retiree community. Uh, it's it, Even in today, if you go through their area, oh, initially um, around late 60s, early 70s, there's only f- around less than 5,000 s- slots. And even today, when you go to the Canyon Lake website, there's still kind of touting this idea that it's a smaller community. I think they say on their website it's 4,800 slots. Uh, They also say the entire area is gated. There's only three ways in. uh, And you do have, they have guards or or like security, they said guarded security at each of the the main points. They do have, um, they call it a planned community. So when they were building this retirement area, it really was, we're going to have We're not going to grow any. We're going to have our stores and, you know, our pharmacy. It's not like a normal city that would grow organically. It's like, here's the the space. We're not going any further than this. But a lot of, at the time, a lot of retirees got drawn to the community. I will say that according to their site, if you you go on it, uh, and it will be linked on our website, that it, I think now in uh, the 21st century, they're trying to update their image a little bit because you have, it looks like a lot of people having fun in the water and they, they, they kind of um, trying to push forward that youthful uh, uh, feel. Yeah. When I was reading about it, I felt like I, I stayed at this place in the Coachella area where it had these homes or little places and it had a gated community where you had to show that you're part of that or something like that. And it felt like, like you're saying, they're trying to update the place that I went to. It felt like you were in a time warp in between the sixties and eighties and stuff like that. It was pretty interesting. I, I, and then looking at like how some of these pocket communities get started in Southern California around the rail lines. And then now as time has progressed, they are becoming like suburbs of suburbs so people are are leaving the bigger cities in southern california and coming to these pocket retirement communities so like there's palm springs and then there's you know the palm springs retirement community adjacent so there's like the greater temecula area and then there's canyon lake next to it weirdly though the home prices i didn't feel were that exorbitant for the area the medium income in the area is, is a little bit on on the higher side but as far as, I mean, I, the, the most expensive house I think I saw was like somewhere in the neighborhood of like $2 million, which again, it's California. So that's Southern California for a nice home is not crazy. But on the low end, it was, there were some homes that were as low as four or $500,000, which again, for a gated community near a man-made lake, that doesn't seem like that crazy to me. So one thing, this is in Canyon Lake, but the main detective is from the Paris Police Department. Is that Paris something different, or is it part of it? 
So Paris is actually a community like kind of adjacent to Canyon Lake. Uh, it was also settled around the same time in the early 1880s by uh, European Americans. It was a way station, again, for the California Southern Railroad between Barstow and San Diego. So again, if you look, if you were to look at a rail map in the late 1800s and where a lot of these towns are located, you're going to see a direct correlation. So it's it's the it is a lot larger place than Canyon Lake, and so I think when those police officers and detectives, Canyon Lake doesn't necessarily really have their own uh, police force, where the, they might now. At the time, it didn't seem like they did. It's just weird. Something, a couple of weird things about Paris that I thought were interesting. It is actually home to the largest uh, railroad museum, Southern California Railroad Museum, and Farmer Boys Restaurant chain, which was started in 1981. Started in Paris, California, which I thought was kind of kind of interesting. If you're familiar with Farmer Boys, and then uh, another on a, a more serious note that pertains to California true crime, it is the scene of the notorious Turpin case, where a husband and wife kept their 13 children, uh, some as old as 29, as slaves in their homes, malnourished and abused for their entire lives uh, until the crime came to light. And that case uh, was broke in 2018. But that, that was my take on why you'd have these Paris uh, uh, police officers, uh, much like when we talked about the Houston bank robbery case, why some of those police officers came from neighborhood and towns. So the June Roberts murder was on February 28th. Now, on March 2nd, they, they start finding out some of the spending patterns from these cards that were stolen. After Gray would do these murders uh, from the, the TV show I watched— like almost immediately she would go get, she would either go get lunch or get her hair styled. And after the killing of June Roberts, she went and got her hairstyle and brought her boyfriend's son with her. Dana had blonde, kind of long blonde hair and she got it cut short and uh, dyed red. In the appointment book, she had wrote down the name June Roberts that matched the credit cards, but the boy also got his haircut. And so she wrote down the boy's first and last name. They didn't, they, I think they were just, the show and everything was protecting the boy. So they never gave the name of the boy. The detectives, they got this information, tracing everything. So they started calling schools uh, to see if a boy matched that. And they didn't find any information. And they actually called Jerry and started talking to her about it. So pretty sure Jerry is not a suspect by this point. And they told her all the exact same information and nothing she couldn't think of anyone that that fits that description. Which is weird to think that she's married to Dana's dad. And I guess, I mean, different families are different families. But you would think that if my stepdaughter showed up one day with a haircut red, a haircut short and dyed red, that, and, and then like maybe a few days later, the police were to, to notify me and say, hey, if, do, do somebody fit this description? I kind of... Maybe I would think of that, or maybe that's the idea of like I can't believe that my own that somebody in my family would be able to do something like that. So we know Jerry knew June Roberts. Did Dana? I don't know if she completely knew her, but Jerry and Bruce lived very close to June Roberts. So it could have been acquaintances. It could have been Dana's met her, something like that. Yeah, and especially with this this place at having you know, less than 5,000 people, I can imagine that maybe you would, especially in, in a, in a semi retirement or even a retired community, if you spend time in like, everybody kind of knows everybody, even not necessarily like we're best friends, but, and not in a busy body negative sort of way, but like you kind of watch out for your neighbors. You, you, you know, when people are driving by or you see people maybe at social events or things like that, playing cards or, but also going to that point, the whole situation of her going up to the door asking if she has a book about a drinking problem, you wouldn't just ask a stranger that. Right. So she probably did know her. Maybe it sounds if June has a book on drinking problems, maybe they've talked about that before. Who knows how? The, but it does sound like that they might have known her, or she might have known her. So now on March 10th, Dorinda Hawkins, who was 55, she was working at the Lake Elsinore Trading Post. When she was attacked, Lake Elsinore is a west of Canyon Lake and Trading Post. It's like an antique store. Uh, Dana came in to talk to her and asked her about a frame. She needed a frame to put a picture of her mother in. 
uh, Dorinda turned to grab like this picture frame when Dana pulled a rope out of her own pocket and wrapped it around her neck. It, the detective actually called it a noose. So I found this interesting because everything else, the knives in Norma Davis's murders, they look like kitchen knives. The phone cord was used for June Roberts, a phone cord that was in the house. Now she is carrying around a supposedly noose in her pocket for like anything. So this is really, she's stepping up what she's doing. She's also coming prepared. Right, yeah. I mean, it's she's actively pre- thinking about it ahead of time. I'm going to prepare. I got my murder kit with me. And then I'm going to, I am going to kill this person in front of me. Right. While Dorinda was being strangled, she said to Gray, why do you want to kill me? I have eight kids. Dana says back to her, I'm not here for your money. And then calmly says, be quiet, just relax, just relax. Uh, Dorinda blacked out from the loss of oxygen. She came to about an hour later, and that's when she called police. She was able to provide them with a description, and they did like a police sketch of Dana. Dana took only about $25 out of the register. So she didn't, so Dana didn't really even check on her and see if she was still alive. It was just, she took it for granted, like, oh, I strangled her. She must be dead. And yeah, then- they, they talked about that when she started, maybe hypothetically, she does it not thinking. And then she's like, I'm in a public store in the middle of the day oh. that she might not. Worried about being interrupted in the middle of it, so she has to leave before she can finish. Right, she started thinking, I might get caught. Okay. So, yeah, this is this seems very like the, you know how serial killers always, um, they escalate. This seems to be, it's new scenery. It's in the middle of, in a shopping center, mm-hmm. or a, there, it's a store. It's not at just a house. Bringing your own uh, rope this time. And a more capable target than the previous two people you've killed because mm-hmm. the previous two people you killed are, you know, significantly older. I mean, 10 years is still 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in one case, you know, her first victim is in, in her eighties in their homes. Yeah. This is a significant ramping up. Although her second victim while a child's in the car is that's crazy to me. And I find it weird because this is maybe we just haven't studied women serial killers enough, but it seems very different from the ones that we know about. So we did talk about this before, and uh, Jessica got some stats on women serial killers because this seems like something we're kind of in the dark about. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, I mean, serial killers in general, despite kind of our society's fascination with them and even ours personally, there's just so few of them. So studies are difficult. And women serial killers in particular, until around the 1980s, it was just sort of believed that they didn't really exist, despite the fact that there are several throughout history. Um, So knowledge about them and specific statistics are difficult. But one of the things that's really interesting about this case in a study, a 2019 study that I will link on our website, found that most female serial killers tend to kill at home or at work. About 80% know their victims. But based on the study I saw... It really focused on knowing them kind of well, like your coworkers every day or someone in your own home. So even though she kind of knows these people, with the exception of, for all we know, Dorinda, that victim choice is a kind of deviation from other female serial killers. The other thing that's really different, they believe, from female and male serial killers is that men often murder out of pleasure, sexual pleasure in particular. 75% of male serial killers' motive were sexual. And 52% of women, their motive was financial. So I think we talked about that in the Dorothea Puente case. And here, there seems to be a financial motive, but at the same time, she's not really taking a lot of money. She's not using it to live. So it also seems like a deviation. Right. For $25 from this last one. Yeah. And when she says, I'm not doing it for the money, I don't know if that was just, she said that right then. I'm not sure. Or if that was like the truth. The other really unique thing seems to be her method of killing. Women serial killers often use, over 50% often use poisoning. And the other high use is smothering. So even though she's using asphyxiation, um, she's doing it in a really different way than a lot of female serial killers have done. The rope with the telephone cords, um, the noose in this one, the bludgeoning, as well as the 
stabbing attack those are all really different than you know what we what these people in the study believe um, are commonly used among female serial killers although I would preface that by saying that since it's something new that people are studying we may find other things or other eventually if you find more serial killers that are female you might find that these statistics will change and vary but from what we know now and I think something that they talked about a lot in the show was that she really didn't like her mother. So she's, she's murdering older women that they think might have reminded her of her mother and then buying things to feel like she's in control. I didn't really, I, I'm only bringing it up cause we're talking about it right mm-hmm. now, but I didn't want to get into the whole, there was a lot of like hypotheticals and psychological things that they talked about. And the mother thing kept coming up that she supposedly didn't like her at all. Which is, I mean, we've seen that in other, right. you know, when you read other stories or information about other serial killers, there's always, it seems like an easy one they're always throwing. Not that it is not true, but, right. you know, there's always that parent component or it seems to be like that is a, a well that's often gone back to. Well, it's interesting because there are male, male serial killers who kill for whatever reason, but may also steal at the same time. And it's just kind of interesting. In this case, they use the shopping thing as a kind of motive for her, which is, right. seems kind of gender specific when, yeah. you know, you wouldn't necessarily, necessarily say that about a male serial killer, but they also stole money. It just wouldn't be as, I don't know, the fact that she got her hair done and yeah. <laughs> went to lunch. And that could, that could be have to do with how, the, how it's reported as well. You know, the, yeah. the source that, that's doing that, it's not like, is that the police saying that or is that a, a journalist that doesn't know the whole story saying that? Hi, this is Tony, the host of the Flix X Raid podcast. Each week, I am joined by guests. Meow. Hello. Yo. Why, hello there. Hello. And we have a roundtable discussion where we ray a bunch of our favorite films and some really terrible ones. If you want, you can follow us on all the major platforms. To find out more, you can find us online at www.flixxray.com. And you can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram if you want to reach out to us. Good night, Internet. So after March 10th at the trading post, and I think closer to March 16th, which we'll talk about soon, Dana comes over to Jerry's house and talks to her. And I think this might be like what you were talking about the first time she might have seen Dana in a while. She shows her, Dana shows her her new hairstyle from blonde to red, and she talks about how her boyfriend's son is starting to call her mom. All of a sudden, this really clicks with Jerry. And she started thinking about the detective asking her about it. And she was a little, you know, I I think like you were saying, she didn't want to think it. And she wasn't, it didn't seem like she was like, oh gosh, can this be? And then she finally like, I don't know if it was later in the day or the next day, she saw the police sketch and Mm -hmm. she's like, I've got to call the detective. So she calls the detective. So now on March 16th, uh, another elderly, elderly woman, Dora Beebe, she was 87, of Sun City, uh, was found dead. And before I go a little further, you want to talk about Sun City because it's a whole new region. Yeah, and Sun, Sun City is a lot like what we've talked about in these others. It's a master plan community for senior citizens. This was actually started specifically to be a retirement community for anyone over 55. It's about four square miles. It has one public golf course, uh, two recreational centers, which uh, are it's more like a clubhouse, like where the residents can come and, and hang out. And, and there's a tennis, uh, a tennis court, swimming pools. There is a commercial center with, they said supermarkets. I don't know how many that is, but uh, grocery stores. There's some retail shopping. It was originally built in 1960, and it's actually one of four planned communities that were designed by a guy named Del Webb, who actually really becomes famous for designing these types of communities in Southern California, Nevada, uh, Florida, and Arizona, all places where you see a, a, a group, a large group of senior citizens going to retire. Uh, eventually, it's going to start to be expanded in the 1980s, and then again in the 90s when the population begins to boom. The difference between this and, say, Canyon Lake or even Paris is that the medium household income for this area is way below the poverty line. 
Mm-hmm. And it seems like it has been. Now, part of that, I think, is due to the fact that it's um, retirees, but it is something to think th- to, to consider. So with Dora Beebe, I guess Dana had seen Dora at a bank ATM and followed her home after she withdrew money. Dana asked her for directions. She followed her home. Dana asked her for directions, and Dora said she could come inside and use a map. She had been strangled like the others with a telephone cord, and she was also beaten severely with an iron. She also had strangulation marks made with hands, so this seemed like a lot. After the murder, Dana, that same day, withdrew, I saw two different reports, either 1700 or 2000 from her bank account. From Doris, from uh, Doris. Dora Beebe's account. Right. So I found a little information about Dora. Uh, her daughter, Julia Whitecomb, says of her mother, quote, she was pretty and funny and warm and a better cook than anyone else's mother. Nobody made better pie. Her quilts were lovely. And her grandson, David, said, quote, her smile, I think, is what I'll remember best about my grandmother. The light in her eyes at Christmas, opening a big bottle of vanilla, her suppressed laughter at jokes she thought really shouldn't be funny, but were. All this seems to be, this murder is taking place simultaneously while the police are setting up a surveillance after Jerry had given all that information. So it's pretty crazy how... She's identified by the eyewitnesses and everything, and at 1 p.m., they start surveillance on her home, but she wasn't home at the time. Dana was already at Dora Beebe's house. The cops finally get surveillance on her at 3 p.m. when she does come home. So After she's already killed Dora Beebe. Within about an hour. <sighs> oh. Uh, she came home, left again, and the cops followed her, and she was arrested about 6 p.m., They had a search warrant for her house, and when they went in there, they found all these new items she had just bought. She had cowboy boots, swimsuits, vodka, which I guess she was she was drinking a lot at this time. Uh, She had a ski mask that she had bought. She also bought both men's and women's size things, such as shoes and clothes. Was there any indication that that stuff was get, she was giving to her husband, or was it? It, like it could a, have been gifts. Like a compulsive yeah, thing. it could have been that too. It, it didn't say, but I mean, there were two men, a boy right. and a man. Right. Um, they also found the size six shoes that are the same brand and match the print found at the first murder. So I found a couple articles that came out the next day after this murder. It, it was still in between them announcing that they had arrested her and stuff, or the articles might have been written early, but this felt like Night Stalker fear, like in Los Angeles, the community and stuff. Um, Also like Puente Hills, how that one lady said she was buying pepper spray and stuff like that. Um, They were talking about how everyone was buying new locks for their doors, security lights, home alarms, and even guns. One quote from the paper that was interesting was a woman saying, quote, this has changed our pattern. We can't go out and look at the stars. So I think how you've explained both the communities, their, their retirement, they're thinking, all they're thinking about is like swimming and pickleball and grandkids. They're not thinking about this. And this is really like just destroying everyone. Right. And it, it does to speak of kind of that, that fear that I think, you know, I won't say we're all living with that constant fear, but, you know, you go somewhere in the, late at night, you kind of, you know, touch your wallet and keep keys close. You, you have that kind of nascent fear of I might be attacked, but having relatives that live in communities like this, the reason why they moved here was so they could kind of get away from that. You know, there is a gate. So because they are older, they live in this kind of place so that they can be protected and they don't have to worry about that stuff, you know? And, and like you said, and, you know, enjoy retirement. And then to have this happen all of a sudden, I can imagine that that would, and especially in a small community, you know, like we talked about Canyon Lake, like, you know, 4,800 people. That's re- then you got to be looking at everybody. Was it an outsider? Was it an insider? Was it, you know, who is the person that's doing this? So what you were saying, it seems like a community like this, they pro- a lot of people probably know everyone because right. you're in a gated community. So the talk of the, the area, they never thought about 
that it might be someone they knew, they were thinking insiders. And things that were getting thrown out were gardeners or ma- maintenance workers. Right. So, which, as terrible as it would sound, like I can, in some way, putting myself in a position of if I'm a retiree living in the area, well, I know my neighbors. I see them all the time. The only people I don't really know, uh, right or wrongly, are the only outsiders that are coming in are maintenance workers, gardeners, you know, things like that. Uh, people like that, you know, or I guess the only other one would be, well, and we know in this case, it's it's relatives, people that are coming in to view or to view, to, to help out a family. You know, uh, I live next door to Sean. It's Sean's, Sean's family is coming in to visit him this weekend. Yeah, this was the days way before a- Airbnb. So it's not like you're just having, right. you know, things rented out. Yeah. So she's arrested and she's interrogated. While she's being interrogated... Um, in one room at the police station in Paris, the Sun City police are in there trying to fill out something for the murder of Dora Beebe. They're interrogating Dana, and she's talking about it's like the coincidence um, defense where she found some credit cards and she just happened to use them, which was a bad choice on her. And then they say, oh, so then another woman's murdered and you you happen to be the person who found those credit cards and she's like yeah it's just a coincidence and then somehow she gets on that yeah she found these cards and she says the name bb and the people interrogating her don't even have that case yet because they're arresting her for the first so the main detective goes out and asks the sun city police hey what's the name on this case and they're like dora bb and it was like she kind of by talking too much, she kind of threw herself under the bus. Yeah, if it's one thing that that reading and doing this podcast has taught me, aside from all the other true crime that we consume, never talk to the police. But at the same time, looking at her, maybe she just thought she was... I think a lot of times we see these things and they, the, the suspect or actual murderer thinks they're so much smarter then the police, mm-hmm. and they can just talk their way out of it. Well, in this one, too, I, I know we've seen others, as we're recording this, we had just hung out for a bit and watched uh, Forensic Files, where you know the, the killer spent time cleaning things up and really fixing the murder scene. She didn't. You know, she basically walks into a place, kills somebody, and then walks out, almost like it, like it didn't even happen. I'm really astounded that... that she didn't leave more physical evidence in the place, mm-hmm. you know, that could tie her to that. And then that brazenness. And, and like you said, John, maybe that place to the idea that she thought she was smarter than everyone. That idea of like, I'm going to get away with it. Doesn't matter. Well, the evidence that they did have, they had telephone cords. They had the iron. They had forged checks that she had taken. Oh. They had the credit cards and probably like all that stuff. Uh, the withdrawal of the money from BB's account. They did like a photographic lineup, merchants of stores she shopped at, all the bank employees. There's a lot of eyewitnesses going on. She kept, like you're saying, she didn't do a very good job. She didn't do any cleanup. But this one, in her house, they found the keys to the register and the display display case of the trading post where she attacked Dorinda. Mm. Uh, She also bought things like a massage with credit cards and stuff. And she got a perm, which it's 94. So... You probably got a perm a lot. So there was also the parking sticker on her car. So that was able to get her into the gated communities. I think, I don't know. She used to live in Canyon Lake. I don't know if she lived in the same area that Norma Davis did, but she did, was her nurse when she had the car accident. So yeah. she might have had a sticker there. She'd have a sticker where her dad is. So she had multiple security stickers to get in and a connection to each one of the communities so if somebody saw her there either a she could easily talk her way out of it or b somebody else might say oh that was norma's nurse or that's so-and-so's daughter or so on so so it wouldn't be where you might kind of think mm, it's a little weird but it wouldn't be one that we oh i definitely you don't belong here right well and i think you'd be less likely that they're suspecting a woman as well i don't know how much of the information was available to the public. I don't know. The size six shoe, I think, would be a, a thing that might get people thinking. And probably that's why they looked at Jerry first. But 
you know, like in this last murder, the trusting nature of allowing her to come in, I think probably might not have happened if it had been a male. No, definitely, especially in a in retirement retirement community. And in the in the nineties, you know, I mean, how many female serial killers were in the popular media that people would 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 immediately I think maybe now it might be a little bit more. People might not necessarily jump to that in conclusion. But I think in the nineties definitely. So going to that point, they did say the detective at the beginning of the episode, when they first found the shoe print, they said they were either looking for a woman or a small man. So even with a size six, which is very small, they couldn't not say a man. Right. And, I mean, if you're going to play the numbers game, statistically, it's more likely that the like somebody to perpetrate violence against a woman is going to be a man. Mm-hmm. And, and multiple murders, statistically, it's still more likely that... You're going to get murdered by a man. So I don't, I don't fault that. I just think it's interesting. So for a trial, Dana had a public defender. She didn't have a job, so she couldn't afford a lawyer. She was held without bail, and they kept pushing the arraignment date back. In the paper on March 22nd, it talks about how Gray walked into the courtroom. She made eye contact with a woman there, and she said softly to the woman, quote, I love you which then the bailiff warned the other woman that she could be arrested for talking or motioning to anyone in custody. After the short hearing, the sheriff rushed that other woman away so no one could talk to her, never found anything else about about this woman. So at the time, Bruce, the dad, did believe Dana that she didn't do it. This could have been Jerry. It could have been... They didn't talk a lot about Dana's personal life that much, so it could have been a friend. It could have been anything. I, I don't know, but... It was an interesting story that they never came back to. This is very drawn out. And with all this evidence against her standing trial, she's uh, standing trial for the two counts of murder and one count of attempted murder. She's not being charged at the moment with Norma Davis, the very first one. This uh, is a murder trial with special circumstances. So at the time, it's a big deal because it would be the first woman in Riverside County to be placed on death row. Uh, Everything through this, the public defender is still using the story that she found some credit cards and used poor judgment for a spending spree. So I don't know, maybe the whole spending spree motive was from their own mouth that journalists just used because they couldn't think of another thing to run with in a way. Yeah, that makes sense. So we've had many cases One we just talked about our last episode with the Houston robbery of an insanity plea. Charles, there was something you said a while ago in another episode, some stats on insanity pleas. And can you refresh our memory on that? Yeah, it's in all the cases in California, at least the ones we've seen, it's it's something like less than 1% of pleas are insanity pleas. And out of that, out of less than 1%, only like one in four actually go in front of a court. And, e- and even less than that are, um, are actually proven. Uh, and, and as we said, uh, I believe we talked a little bit about, uh, in, like you said, the last Houston case. And, and you're considered legally insane if either of these two things occur. One, you don't understand the nature of your crime, criminal or crime or criminal act. or you did not understand that what you were doing was morally wrong. And so unless you can prove either one or both of those, you're not insane. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many of the, the, the cases that use that as a defense don't go in. So I can maybe kind of, she does try to use the insanity plea here and for how vicious and then shopping afterwards, maybe I could see that, that she didn't understand. But, I mean, that could just go with why she was pleading. Yeah, I would actually, when you initially started going over this uh, case, it was the one, I think, that came close enough. I still have a hard time believing she's insane. Right. But I think of any of the one, it would be one that I would put into, I could understand that argument to be made. So this was her route the whole time. But then on September 9th, 1998... So this is four years after this all happens. She pleads guilty 
drops the whole insanity and pleads guilty to the two murders and the attempted murder and was sentenced to life without parole. Now, this is something I found really interesting is they made a deal for this whole thing, but in the deal should not be charged with the first murder of Norma Davis in exchange that she will never appeal anything, which I just find really crazy that you can make that deal, but also the just like I've talked, the whole hope thing that we've talked about, like, you know that you're in jail the rest of your life with no hope that you'll ever figure it out. Even the the little bit of appeals. Yeah. But I wonder if, because the, some of the police reports about, or what was reported in the media about that first murder are far beyond what she perpetrates later. I mean, the, the, one of the accounts talks about, um, the stabbing being so vicious it nearly decapitated Norma's right. head. And so I wonder if part of that was if I plead to these and I go away for life without the ability of possibility of parole, you don't pers- prosecute me for the first one, which a judge or jury could take as extenuating circumstances or special circumstances to get me the death penalty. Yeah. So I wonder if part of that really was I'm willing to give up my, my outside life, the possibility of parole, or like you said, that hope, because I don't want to take the chance on I'm going to be convicted of a death penalty case. It was also that. It was a family member, so I don't right, know right. if uh, she just really didn't want to have any, like, knowing it was someone part of her family in a way. It's possible. She didn't I, think, be, I can't that imagine that it. anybody in the family would, would think that she was innocent of that right. at that point. So in 2014, Gray is in prison at the Chowchilla Women's Facility with almost all the other women that we've covered on this show. And so there's this story of, you know, the somewhat market for things that murderers have made or like the term murder memorabilia. Well, she got into this market and she ended up selling for $250 a plain, some white panties that she wrote on, which looked like a Sharpie with her name and her prison number. Thoughts on this? I don't, I don't even know. Yeah. I, I find it distasteful. I find it really disturbing. I, I think for me, this is exactly that distasteful. I saw that she in prison drew these clown pictures, and they are actually scary. I have no fear of clowns, but the the pictures were scary, and I feel that could be more of a selling item. Like John Wayne Gacy had his photos. Charles Manson recorded songs. I can see maybe as like a historian history thing you might want to know about those things but this to me is kind of pointless well and i think yeah i can see that like as a historian somebody that's collecting those and studying them and maybe cataloging them for you know a criminology museum or or the study of violent offenders in the future i actually i I find the dealing of them in poor taste i i think and i think that's where you know it's not and and to each his own on the outside and i'm not here to judge in any by any stretch of the imagination but i'm going to a little bit so i also find that it's different because you're not collecting you know i i I think back to like you know ed gein the wisconsin serial killer and his station wagon you know which was dubbed the murder mobile that after his conviction that got sent into a carny show and got pushed around that's distasteful as it is but they bought that from the estate, not the actual killer. And I think this one, there's this weird gray line where that to me violates that son of Sam law about murderers and criminals profiting off of their crimes because, and I I believe you brought this up in an argument the other night, Sean, the idea is that nobody would know about Dana Gray unless she had committed this crime. So where it doesn't, she's not necessarily profiting off of, she's not selling her story. She's selling a personal item that somebody bought because of who she is. The one thing that is fascinating to me is the difference between the murderers, the serial killers or the murderers that you talked about, you know, Manson and John Wayne Gacy, who are selling almost like what would be kind of considered intellectual properties in a way, like paintings or songs, even though, you know, there's that myth that serial killers, male serial killers in particular, are geniuses and that's a complete myth you know a certain percentage are smart but not like in general 
Um, and certainly Charles Manson, from what I know, isn't known for his good music. So it's just kind of fascinating that they're selling art and she's selling underwear. If right. that makes sense, there's that like that's why dichotomy. Was, that's really like the male women thing. But that's what I was bringing up. I feel like people, I can't believe they're buying some panties instead of those clown pictures because those were horrifying. And it it's more of something that's, yeah, intellectual art than this with a sharpie. Yeah, because I think it, that play that to me also plays straight into that like women in prison. Myth, you know that Skinamax v- version of like what what women are doing in prison, and so it it's gross on a lot of different levels. Yeah, it's just it's just interesting to me those two and how we treat different kinds of murderers. And so that's about it. She's is then there with out parole. Any last words? It's still so weird. I, I think the l- one thing, too, that we didn't go to is the timeline was so quick. Yeah. It started, like, right around Valentine's Day, and she was arrested mid-March. So it's pretty much one month this all happened. And I know I, I know that a lot of these crimes we can't look at and say there's a reason for them. There's just never, it doesn't seem like there's, and we say this all the time. But struggling with the idea of, like, this woman just up one day and decides, oh, I'm just going to go in and kill these women. And then doesn't, in, in a short amount of time, with no real gain. Like, yeah, she has that shopping. And I do, I do know that, that that's been used in some of the things you see online about her. It's like, oh, she had a shopping addiction, so she killed. No, it doesn't seem like that. It seems like she killed and then went shopping. It doesn't seem like the two are correlated necessarily. So I just, I find that it's just an odd case. I feel like it was a good thing she went shopping because it's part of how they catch her. Right. Oh, and yeah. she doesn't seem like she would have stopped. No. And it, it's, tra- it's always tragic, but that idea that these people went to these places as almost like a reward. Like this was, you know, they'd worked hard their lives. They'd had these homes. They had a community that they felt safe in. They had specifically sought these out to be safe in. And that was robbed for, for no reason whatsoever. And Charles will be reading our cold case tonight. On the night of September 9th, in the small town of Fillmore, California, the body of 90-year-old Florence Hackney was found dead in her home. She was discovered by her daughter, Margaret Haskell, who lived just a block away and was checking on her mother after going to dinner with her husband. Margaret will say that she originally thought that her mother was unconscious and called police as soon as she discovered her. Florence was then rushed to hospital, where she would be pronounced dead by strangulation. A later coroner's report will also show that Florence was raped before her death. There was nothing missing from the home, and police have had no motive as to why somebody would want to harm her. At the time, there were some fingerprints found at the scene, but it was not released if these were Florence's, her family's, or possibly even the murderer's. Police also looked into the possible connection to a burglary of an unoccupied home across the street that was broken into earlier in the week. Florence was well known and liked in the small community where she lived for 30 years. She was active in the community as well as her local church. She leaves behind a daughter, a son, three grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. She also left a community that has never stopped looking for the person or persons that are responsible for her death. If you have any information regarding Florence's murder, no matter how insignificant, please contact the Ventura County Cold Case Unit at area code 805-383-8704 or contact them by email at coldcase at ventura.org. Thank you for listening to this episode of California True Crime. For a full list of our sources, as well as more information on the case, head over to our webpage at californiatruecrime.com. You can also support the show by finding a link to our Patreon on this page, which has the option of ad-free episodes, as well as finding a link to our web store where we have California True Crime merchandise for sale. If you'd like to contact us, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Cali True Crime. If you enjoyed the episode, please leave a review. We'd like to thank 
that quality person, Melanie Duncan. This was recorded at Snail Ranch Studios. This has been a production of Way Grimace.